Phantomaniacs, welcome to the newest episode of the Needless Things Podcast, where we talk about toys, movies, music, and all manner of pop culture dorkery. I am your host, Dave, and it is time for another Q&A, where I take questions from you, the Phantomaniacs, in the Needless Things Podcast Facebook group, and also uh, general Facebook, the, the general population. I go to Gen Pop and ask for some questions as well. But the best questions always come from the Needless Things Podcast Facebook group. And if you're not a part of that, well, you should be. And those get priority as well. Um, excuse me. I just got off of work. I am drinking some water. And if you want to know something really uh, disgraceful, it's not, it's not disgraceful, but... I, I've got to work tomorrow and Saturday, and so I can't uh, have the same sort of liquid enjoyment I normally have when I'm recording. So I poured myself one shot of Elijah Craig into a tiki sippy glass uh, full of ice. And I really like this thing. I've never used it before. I, I think Mrs. Troublemaker bought them a long time ago. They're kind of like mason jars, but they're glass tiki's, and then they have a nice straw that goes in the top. There's like a little rubber gasket around. Like if you drop this, granted it's probably going to shatter, but it won't, it won't spill out of where the straw comes from because there's this like rubber gasket around the straw, and it's like a really nice, might even be like an acrylic straw. Uh, but it, but. Putting all that aside, it is still a sippy cup, uh, sippy cup with Elijah Craig in it. And I just took another little sip, so I can have, I can have one shot of this delicious adult beverage. Uh, but that, that's it for me. That's all I can uh, uh, have tonight, since I've got to work tomorrow. I have to be responsible. Uh, and and besides, it's healthy. Uh, it'll kill the germs, right? That, that's all you got to do is bathe yourself in Elijah Craig and the coronavirus will not come anywhere near you and neither will anybody else except probably the police. Uh, all right. All right. So let's, let's get on with it. I already said this is a Q and a, uh, news wise. I don't, there's, there's no news. The closest thing to news is, uh, the second wave of super sevens new Japan pro wrestling action figures is up for pre-order now. But I don't know who any of those guys are. I don't care about Japanese wrestling, really. And that's my personal thing. If you do, that's awesome. That's great. I just I can't keep up with all of the American wrestling uh, that's out there, let alone expanding beyond our borders. I've got I have other things going on in my life. Uh, so those are up. They look incredible, and they fi- they revealed the packaging for Wave 1, and it looks like just the packaging, I was like, maybe I should get one of these guys. I wouldn't mind having like a Will Ospreay, that'd be kind of cool. But, and, and once they are up on Big Bad, like in stock, maybe I'll order one, because obviously I'm going to be really curious about the quality and the build and everything else. I'd love to do an unboxing, which by the way, if you have not yet subscribed to the Needless Things YouTube channel, what is wrong with you? I'm putting some good stuff up there, people. And I'm, I'm welcoming constructive criticism. I'm welcoming input. This is a, uh, a new thing for me that I'm currently really into and enjoying. But it's because I've figured out a way that I can do it that's not a massive time suck where I can record an unboxing or a review or a video or whatever. And it takes basically a few minutes to edit it on my phone i can do everything in my phone i don't have to transfer any files uh it's very very manageable for me with the limited amount of time and effort that i'm really willing to invest in this stuff now 10 years ago maybe i would have been a little bit more of a workhorse but now i'm doing this stuff because i enjoy it i don't expect anybody to watch anything i i have 
I have learned my place in the internet, so to speak. So I just do this because I like it. I like giving people content, and it's up to the people to find the content. I share it the best I can. Uh, and if you if you would be willing to share it, that would be appreciated. Okay, so this is a Q&A. I'm going to get to the Q&A in a minute, but I've, I put up on Facebook live that this is the last chance for questions, and I have a response already. Now, our head of research, Ryan Schweck, already has two questions, and they're really, really good ones. So normally what I do is I'll answer one question per person per episode unless I run out of questions, and then I'll loop back to them at the end. Uh, I, I'll tell you right now, I'm probably going to hit both of Ryan's questions later on in this episode because they're excellent. He is our head of research, after all. But he did drop a question in here, and it reminds me that there is other news. Uh, so I'm just going to dive right into this one and pretend this is our news segment. Uh, <laughs> so, they are really going to put out the Snyder Cut, huh? And that's, I guess, the other big piece of news that I wasn't even going to mention, because quite, quite frankly, okay, I can be blasé about this and say, who gives a shit? Well, obviously, lots of people give a shit, and it's fine that they give a shit. If you don't give a shit, you don't need to tell people that you don't give a shit. Uh, I think it's, well, one, I'm flabbergasted, because I was in the camp that really, truly believed there was no Snyder Cut, that Snyder hadn't spent enough time actually making the movie for there to be a Snyder Cut, uh, I have not read all the details. I'm not going to lie, because I, I don't need the details. Look, when it hits HBO Max, guess what? I'm going to watch it. Oh, that's Snyder Cut. For those who somehow aren't aware of what I'm talking about, it's uh, Justice League, the the DC movie that came out, that we reviewed on the Needless Things podcast. You can look that episode up. Uh, and, and found it to be a lot of fun. Even sourpuss old Arian had fun with the movie. I think we all acknowledged that it wasn't the Justice League movie we ever would have wanted, but it was fun in and of itself, and especially compared to some of their other output, uh, it, it was a good time. Have I gone back and watched it again? Once, sort of. Uh, is it something I'm going to revisit from time to time? Eh, probably not. But I will revisit the Snyder Cut simply out of morbid curiosity. Because, I, I mean, I have to. I'm a comic book fan. I'm a Batman fan. Uh, I, I love these characters. I love seeing what people do with these characters. And sometimes it's not good. Uh, but sometimes it is. And this will be fascinating in the same way that that one exorcist movie that they they shot and shit canned and brought in another director and i can't remember it what one of the directors i i really really like and i can't remember who it is right now is it rennie harlan or did he do exorcist 3 now i can't remember i'm not going to look it up because we're not here to talk about the exorcist but anyway they're two entirely different versions of like the fourth exorcist movie that uh and i can't remember which one is the one i liked but this doesn't happen a whole lot where two entirely different creative visions for the same movie end up getting released usually all we get is something like wolfman that was uh joe johnston and then some other guy directed and I, I'm sure there are people out there who are infuriated that I'm referring to whoever the other director is as some other guy because they're massive fans and they think the whole thing should have been his project and Joe Johnston ruined it. And then there are Joe Johnston fans who think the other guy was crazy and doing the wrong thing. It, it doesn't matter. We never got two versions of The Wolfman. Didn't happen. It would have been interesting if it did, though, right? I don't like that movie. Uh, there's some good performances in it, but I think it's not very good, and I think it's very apparent that two different people did it. And Justice League, while I did have fun with it and found it entertaining, again, it's very apparent that they're two different creative visions, and while there will never be the opportunity for a true Whedon cut, uh, we do get to see, perhaps, uh, a Snyder. His, his, I wanted to say Scott Snyder. Wrong Snyder. Uh, I want to say, Zack Snyder, his original idea for the film. So, yes, 
uh, head of research, they really are going to put out the Snyder Cut, and uh, I really am going to watch it because I, I have to. If you if you're so uh, snooty and determined to be hateful towards anything Zack Snyder does, that you won't even just out of morbid curiosity give this thing a look, then you know I, I well you know what honestly I understand, but I'm going to watch it. So there, there's question number one. And now I need to get into another more narrative thing. And that is my experiences on eBay as of late. So to bring up the Needless Things YouTube channel again, uh, it's, it's there. You need to go subscribe. I am trying to... Well, okay. There will be two new unboxings a week. That is my plan. I do not intend to go beyond that. And I actually have like three videos banked right now that I have been tempted to just go ahead and put one up like, oh, one extra won't hurt. But I don't want to get myself into the same position I got with the website way back in the day where I felt this obligation to put up five posts a week. And you guys, if you don't know this, you can go to oldneedlessthings.com. The old website, the original website is there. I'm still paying to keep that thing up because from time to time people will want to know like, you know, where is this review? What did you do? Have you ever done this? And I'll send them a link to oldneedlessthings.com. And uh, it's it's all there archived. But I felt like I had to do five posts a week and I did that for like six or seven years. Um, and it was a lot of pressure. It was a lot of hard work. And it got me... In a roundabout way, I got a lot of cool experiences because of it. So at, at no point do I think I wasted my time, but I don't want to get myself in a position again where I feel obligated to provide free content to an internet that doesn't really care. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do I'm gonna do what I've always done. I'm gonna do my thing. I'm gonna do my thing the way I think I should. I'll take suggestions, and if it if it works within the way that I do things, then I'll I'll do them. And if it doesn't, like a suggestion is, well, you should cut video of yourself talking about the thing with pictures of the thing and with you opening the thing. That's too much. I can't do that. That that involves multiple takes or multiple cameras. No, I'm not, that's not what I'm here for. For me, the focus is the toy. So when you watch a, an unboxing or a review or whatever on the Needless Things YouTube channel, the focus is on the toy. You will see my hands opening the thing, holding it up to the camera, because you're, you're not there for my face. That's my belief anyway. Uh, I want When I watch videos about toys, which I don't often do, it's annoying to me when the focus is on the person and not on the, the toy or the object because I want to see a review. I want to see this thing up close. I want to see the colors and the sculpt and everything else, the articulation. Uh, I, I'm not there to see this dude's head. That's, that, to me, is not about honest critique of toys. That, to me, is a vanity show. And, and look, that's what we all are. Of course I want attention. Of course I want opportunities to get on a microphone so people can hear what I have to say. But when you get down to the nitty gritty, I love toys and the point is the toy. So I, I got off on a bad tangent there. So this, my whole, my whole deal here was go to the Needless Things YouTube channel and you can find uh, me unboxing a Holy Grail action figure. And that action figure, I'll go ahead and tell you now because it's been out for a couple weeks. Well, it's been out since, since my birthday. Uh, I went on eBay and finally bought one dar from the masters of the universe classics line. It's a figure that has eluded me for quite some time now. And I finally decided I was just going to man up and pay what I had to pay so I could have one dar on my shelf and stop thinking about it. Uh, and, and it was great. It was a great decision. So having done that between that experience and the recent GI Joe windfall from Wilson that I'll keep talking about forever and ever and ever, because it was, absolutely incredible and i still can't believe i have all these figures uh and i am still planning to do 
a mini cast episode where I run down the figures. I just haven't really, I've got other stuff happening. So having gotten all those GI Joes, there were parts that I needed or figures that like, I got all those, but there was no Firefly in there. Well, Firefly is my favorite GI Joe character. I, I had to have a Firefly. So I went on and I found a Firefly for a good price. I, I've done a few things here and there. I had to buy Serpentor's crotch. I had to buy Beachhead's crotch. Like, uh, there, there are lots of little bits and pieces I need. And since there are no conventions in the foreseeable future, or at least not in my foreseeable future, because I'm not going to a place packed with a bunch of strangers in a hot, sweaty hotel ballroom anytime soon. Uh, so I, I, eBay is my resource and I know Mercari is another alternative that's out there, but every time I've gone to it, it seems a little weird. It's almost like the, it's like the Reddit of internet places to buy things. It's, it's confusing and slightly overwhelming to me. Uh, so I've been sticking with, with eBay, which is in, in a way great. And in a way the shits, if you're a seller, everything on eBay is set to default screw the seller it's default seller covers shipping it's default seller um there there are a couple other settings they have to change every single time because it's just the intent is to screw the seller over which is bizarre to me uh but i guess we'll take it because what other avenues do we have for moving merchandise so i have been buying and selling on ebay lately my selling experiences have been not awesome because people keep trying to lowball me like you put up a, a i i made a a big boy purchase on ebay it's another holy grail i'm not going to tell you what it is yet because it's going to be another big unboxing it's going to be another very a very special episode of the needless things youtube show it's not really a show but whatever uh so i'm not i'm not going to reveal, reveal that yet but it is the, I don't know how to describe this, it's the second highest amount of money I have spent on a toy purchase, with the first being the sail barge. And the experience was intense. So... Another thing you can, or actually, no, I did this in the, uh, I did this in the Facebook group. I don't think I put it over on YouTube. Uh, I bought a Havoc, the GI Joe vehicle, the Havoc. And it was a Sunday morning and I was on eBay doing what you do where you just put in like GI Joe and you search all of eBay and you put in auctions and ending soonest. And that way you can, you can just sort of impulse buy, which is not a good thing to do on eBay, but I was sober I was at work and I was bored and I had a limited amount of time to look. So there were, there were conditions that made it not as bad an idea as it would be if it was two o'clock in the morning and I'd had a whole glass of Elijah Craig and had nothing else to do. That would be a bad situation. This was not so bad. So this havoc pops up and the current bid is like 1990 or something ridiculous like that. And I was like, well, shit, I'll put in this much. And I ended up getting it for 20 bucks. Great. Fantastic very excited it came it's in great shape now i've got havoc in good condition i had to buy a couple extra parts but but still have spent under 40 bucks for a havoc in great condition so i kind of started looking around for some other holy grail items between the experience of getting the havoc and picking up these gi joe parts and getting one dar i was like well ebay's okay and if you have willpower and, and know exactly what you're looking for and what it's worth, it's, it's pretty good. So the auction for the Havoc was pretty intense because it came down to like the last 30 seconds and I went in there and I, bam, put in my bid and it tick, 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 and you win. Well, I did the same thing for this other big boy purchase and I don't, think i want to drop any dollar amounts because that i'll i'll get into that maybe when i when the purchase arrives and i have the opportunity to unbox it but i knew what i was willing to pay for this i knew what it was i knew what it was worth because i've actually been looking at this for years uh sort of casually following along 
and it's something that has held its value and seems to have sort of plateaued in the last couple of years. But this particular auction was unique in that it was 100% complete in what looks to be, and time will tell, you know, once I get it in my hands, we'll find out, but it looks to be fresh out of the box condition. And it is very unusual for this to have all of its parts. So I had to consider that aspect of the value as well. Because you see parts of this frequently and what they sell for, but to get the whole thing in one shot, complete, in great shape, is very special and unusual. To the point where in the time that I've been looking for it, I have never seen one mint in box. Uh, so I did the same thing. I watched this for two days. Did I didn't actually put a watch on it. Um, I kept going back to it. And then the, the last day I put a watch on it, because there were already at this point, I think, 18 bids. And... Uh, it got down to the last minute and I got a little impatient and I just threw in my maximum I was willing to pay and it it shot up once, it shot up twice and it stuck on a price and then nothing happened. eBay like froze up or something. I don't know what happened and it said it ended at a dollar amount well below my maximum bid. But then I got an email that said, sorry, you missed out on this item. And I was, my Phantom Jr. was sitting here right next to me because he was very interested in this whole process of his insane father spending this amount of money on this thing. He actually was pretty caught up in it. It was, it, we, we had fun. Uh, and I'm like refreshing, I'm refreshing my emails. I'm refreshing eBay. And it just says, you didn't win. You didn't win. And I'm like, that's, imp I'm, I'm Luke in empire that's impossible I, i'm losing my shit uh and and i'm very conscious of the fact that i'm sitting next to my 12 year old son who is generally very well composed and together much more so than i am sometimes uh matter of fact there have been two instances lately where i've been a little embarrassed about myself in front of him one was this ebay auction where i'm trying to keep it together so i don't look like a complete lunatic in front of him even though he's known me for 12 years now and he knows exactly how weird i am uh and then the other one we were playing the new wwe game which i think is a lot of fun i can't get into that right now i think it's fun but there was a handicap match and i was like old school getting furious like i used to back when me and arian and a bunch of other guys got together and played smackdown versus raw all the time i would get intensely angry and like mean and i'm very proud of myself that i don't do that anymore but i felt those feelings coming back trying to play this handicap match and it's not it wasn't because the game has problems and it does but this wasn't it it was just because it's a handicap match it's infuriating when that's part of a storyline in a wrestling game. So anyway, two occasions where I'm like very conscious of my son like watching me like is is he getting ready to blow up? What's going on over there? So anyway, finally I refresh eBay and it pops up and says congratulations. I zip over to my emails and it says please pay for this item now and I'm like, "Yes, got it. Oh my gosh, I stood up." And I'm like, "I got it. I got it." And he's like, "Cool. Awesome." And you guys, I think, will understand once I reveal what this item is at some point in the future, not today. Uh, I think you'll get it because there's a whole story to it. There's a whole history. It's very, very special uh, in the world of toys to me and apparently to a lot of people because, like I said, there were 18 bids, and by the time it was over, I think there were 20-something bids. Like People were boom, boom, boom at the last second trying to hit my big boy total, and they didn't. And it still came in well under my max bid. So I feel good about that too. Although, and look, now you know what? I'm not giving you any numbers. I got to save some of this story for however I end up revealing and unboxing this. So the other side of the eBay experiences that I've been having is selling, which is rotten and miserable. But I, in order to cover what I, part of what I spent on this big boy purchase, 
I decided, you know what? I looked at a shelf full of things. I looked at a few shelves full of things. And I said, I would rather have this than those if I had to make a choice. So those got to go. So I boxed up all of my WWE Mattel retro figures. Not, not my Hasbros. Those will never go. Those have sentimentality and history to them. Uh, the the retros, there it's the line is dead. Part of the thrill was in collecting them, and now you cannot collect them anymore. So, and I went and looked at some prices online, and I realized if I sold mine as a lot, it would go a long way toward recouping what I had spent on this other item. And it seemed worthwhile to me. So I put that and a few other things up on eBay. And if you have something that's high dollar and desirable, you get low ballers in your DMs immediately. And there was a guy, I kid you not, this auction was up five minutes. And this guy was like, hey, I'll give you this much right now. And I messaged back and said, well... I can, oh, here's what it was, is I had auction price and buy it now, and I did not have offers on because I just wasn't interested in offers. I don't have to sell this stuff. I am, like, this is not desperation. This is me trying to sell stuff as a businessman, not as a, I got to pay the gas bill. Um, and he's like, well, I'll offer you this. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, um, I'll go change the buy it now to this much, and then he comes back back at me with like, well, I'm not going to pay for that for shipping. And I said, well, then go find him somewhere else. I didn't say that exactly, but that was the gist of it. I'm always very polite, but I'm also very firm. And then another guy comes in like the next day. He at least waited a day and is like, hey, uh, I'll give you this much, but I'm not paying for shipping. Or no, he's explaining to me that my shipping is too expensive. And he's like, hey, oh, no, this is a totally other auction. I'm sorry, I'm getting my stories mixed up. So this was the first guy on the Mattel Retros. Um trying to lowball me on the price and, and didn't want to pay shipping or whatever else. And I finally was like, uh, you know what, buy them somewhere else. And then another guy, so another thing that I've got up, uh, the Super 7 Iron Maiden reaction figures that are really cool. And I bought them at the time because I thought these are really cool. But now I see what they're selling for. And I think, boy, that money would be even cooler because I like Iron Maiden, but I've got all their music. I don't really need their toys, especially not when that first wave is selling for 165 bucks. So I put those up and another guy comes into my DMs and he's like, Hey, you're charging way too much for shipping. And I said, I'm not charging anything for shipping. eBay is determining the shipping because I've gotten burned so many times in the past. I just use their deal. And he sends me another message back and he's like, well, these, these weigh this much and this much, and you could ship them for this much and this much. And I said, that's great. I use eBay's calculated shipping if it's too much for you, maybe you should go look for these figures somewhere else. And I haven't heard back from him, and I'm sure I won't. Oh, one cool thing, though. Um, I, I did get two different people messaging me about the retros. One guy was actually really cool about it. It was it was basically, hey, I'll offer you this much. And I was like, nah, I'll wait and see how the auction does. And he was like, cool, thank you. And then when the auction ended, he's like, I kind of hated I missed out, but glad you got the money you wanted. Like, how cool is that? That was that was an awesome dude. Like I kind of want to send him something for free just for being not a shithead on eBay. Because apparently, more often than not, people on eBay are shitheads. And don't even get me started on the people who win auctions and then take like a week to pay. Ridiculous. But this, the guy who won the retros, uh, he did the buy it now, which means I got more for them than I wanted, uh, or more than I expected, I guess. Uh, he he did bam buy it now, paid in like a minute. So I immediately came down here, boxed them up, slapped the shipping label on, and got them out the next day, even though I've got a two-day processing on all my auctions, because you never know when they're like when it ends, what if I end up having to go into work? I don't want these people expecting it. Like it's really more for the buyers than it is for me, because I don't want them to be like typically I can get stuff out earlier than what's on there. And I think that's better. But anyway, Got this thing out, boom, next day, done. Uh, he's probably got it today, because it turns out he's in Columbus, Georgia. But, uh, so yeah, eBay, it, it's great and it's awful, just like everything else on the internet. All right, so now it's time 
I think official now that I'm like halfway into the time I'd plan to spend on tonight's episode. So you guys are going to get a little bonus because I had I had to get that eBay stuff out of me, and now I've got another one that I have to get out of me that won't take quite as much time. Uh, I was having a conversation on Facebook because I'm doing you know right now with everybody all cooped up, there are all kinds of like post a picture of this, but you know share uh, an image from this all kinds of those things going on Facebook and they're fun. I like doing that sort of daily stuff that keeps you on a schedule of posts. And I mean, it's an easy thing for me to do because I'm really, really bad about maintaining a social media presence. So this gives me something to post about. Uh, so I'm right now I'm doing a 10 toys in 10 days. And my first toy was storage shell Donatello from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the original line, which came out in 1991, uh, and I was 15. 15. Was I 15? Oh my gosh. So in 91, I was 15. Buying storage shell Ninja Turtles, for sure. Uh, and, and I got the question from somebody who I have known for years but only through Facebook. I think we connected over some toy post that I put up, uh, and we've we, every once in a while we kind of chat back and forth through comments, and that's about it. And he's like, it's literally just this dude's first name. He seems to be a very private person, which I respect the heck out of. Uh, but every once in a while he'll comment or something, and, and we seem to have uh, our tastes line up pretty well. And he said, wow, Ninja Turtles were around when you were a kid. And I said something like, they started in 1988 when I was 12 years old. And he was like, I was just kidding. And I was like, no, it's a fair question because 12 years old in 1988, you really shouldn't, like, back then, you weren't playing with toys anymore. And we had, and we had a little conversation about that. Like, I didn't, I didn't take any offense from his question whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I didn't even recognize that he was kind of just joking about the fact that I'm a little older than him. Uh, I, because it's, it's literally true that especially being 15 and buying storage shell Donatello uh, is a little weird back then. And, and believe me, I had me and a couple of friends collected Ninja Turtles, me much more so than them, but, uh, very much on the down low, like nobody else knew that we were still collecting toys. And then what, what, so this led to me thinking about my toy timeline and obviously, I don't want to... Someday, maybe, I'll do an episode that gets into lots of detail. But I did kind of want to lay down for you guys, just so you'd have an idea of, of what my evolution has been or what my collecting has been. Uh, just take a couple of minutes to, to lay out my toy timeline as I remember it. I'm 44 years old. I was born in 1976. And my first action figures that I remember have... I'm sure I had like... Weebles. Well, I did. I had Weebles and Little People. Um, I remember these little furry... I can't remember what they're called right now. I think fur is in the name. But they were little squeakers, and you put your fingers in their arms, and they were like little puppets. And they... Woodsies! They were called Woodsies. Uh, and man, I, 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 a few years ago, almost fell down a Woodsy hole on eBay, because I was finding like all the Woodsies stuff for pretty reasonable prices. I was like, man... I am buying all this woodsy stuff. And then I, I ended up not doing it. I think I found something else I, I wanted more and realized that also that woodsies are a lot of fabric and could potentially be very nasty to have to clean up. But anyway, uh, so so like that stuff when I was much, much younger. But then Migos are the first action figures that I have specific memories of playing with and collecting and going to the store and being like, I need these. Uh, and then Migos into Star Wars. And Star Wars was it from 78, I guess, to 82. So about four solid years of... Uh, because once Star Wars hit with the vehicles, the Migos fell by the wayside. I think I just stopped playing with them entirely, which makes me feel a little bad at this point. But Star Wars was it, man. And then in 1982 discovered G.I. Joe, a real American hero. And that, uh, all along the way, there are other little bits and pieces of toy lines here and there, but I'm talking about the main driving force of my toy collecting. 
So an 82 G.I. Joe came along, and I had stuff from Return of the Jedi, but G.I. Joe was it. From 82 to 88 was G.I. Joe. And I think it even got a little soft. And it, well, 87 was maybe... I can't remember exactly when Battle Force 2000 came out, but that's when G.I. Joe started to die for me. And there might have been a bit of a lull where I didn't even have a primary toy line, but then in 88 when Ninja Turtles hit, boom, that was the new thing. All I cared about was Ninja Turtles. And I never really liked the cartoon very much, but I loved the toy line, which is why a few weeks ago I finally decided, you know what, I have to have these Super 7 toys because they're just like Masters of the Universe Classics. They are remakes of the original toy line, not based on the cartoon or the comics or anything else, uh, which is why they're so must-have for me. And I, I'm glad I finally realized that. Uh, so Ninja Turtles from 88 until about 92-ish, sometime around high school, I pretty much stopped buying toys. And... Then, I can't remember... Well, you know what? No, that's not even true. I'm now remembering because 92... 91, 92 is when Toy Biz started releasing the X-Men figures. I just remembered I didn't really ever stop collecting. I was thinking I paused during high school... But I was buying Toy Biz's X-Men the whole time they were coming out. And that's actually what replaced Ninja Turtles for me. And then I think maybe a couple of years post... Well, it can't be a couple. I graduated in 94. And then in 95, Star Wars. Uh, Kenner relaunched Star Wars. So that was... The, maybe like the last two years of high school I wasn't buying a whole lot of toys but I guess it really never stopped I would have to go and look at Toy Biz's X-Men release uh, releases which the best resource for that sort of thing is figurerealm.com I love that website but I also hate it because it's so often I'll end up finding something and being like oh I have to have this look here's a whole list of it uh, so yeah, th I guess there really was... N I never stopped for more than a year-ish. Uh, because once once Kenner's Star Wars hit, one, I had a, a real job by that point. Uh, because the year, the year after I got out of high school, I was managing a video game store. So I mean, I, I had a real job making real money. And uh, from there on, it was, it was Star Wars... And then McFarlane Spawn and Sideshows Universal Monsters and Movie Maniacs. I mean, from, from there, once you get into the late 90s, it's everything. It's anything that caught my eye, boom, I'm getting it. Uh, so, yeah, that's that. I just want, kind of wanted to throw that out there. As, as far as my, my youth, that's my toy timeline. And now it's time to get some questions and I was afraid I wasn't going to have enough but fortunately I have eaten up a ton of time with this biographical stuff that you may or may not be interested in I don't know I hope I hope I've at least made it a little entertaining to listen to uh, alright let me take another sip of my Elijah Craig from my tiki sippy cup and I should probably chase that with a little bit of water so I don't choke on my words Very important, uh, everybody. Hydrate and gyrate. Always. All times. Hydrate and gyrate. Go check out the trailer for Troublemaker, a film that may or may not ever come out. Uh, all right. Let me check in real quick with my live request for questions. I think Schweck's probably going to be it. People are doing other things this time of the night. Yeah, there, there are a few likes on it, but no more questions. Uh, that's okay. So let's move on to the existing questions. And the first one comes from our friend, the award-winning Bobby Nash. L Bobby says, Bobby asks, Looking back over your creative career, what has been your biggest surprise? Um, and that's an interesting question because the way that everything has happened, 
not much has been a surprise because everything I do requires a certain degree of planning and foresight and awareness and preparation. Uh, so, I mean, there have been things that have been better than I expected or things that, that people have liked more than I knew that they would or, or whatever the case may be. But the biggest actual surprise of of my creative career as he calls it would be back in 2014 or 13 i guess it had to be 14 when i just really really i mean since i was a little kid i've wanted to host a game show and i had this idea that dragon con would be a great place to do a sort of adult remote control double dare kind of show but filthy hilariously filthy but filthy and i knew i needed somebody with some experience i knew i needed some kind of co because in my head uh actually you know what the sort of the prototype not of the concept of the show but for the atmosphere i wanted to create was viva variety uh, I wanted something with people singing and dancing and having fun and doing ridiculous things. And uh, Viva Variety was so good. And, and I liked the idea of the male and female hosts playing off of each other. And I had gotten to know Le Sexoflex a bit at the time. And I don't think I even knew Dana that well. I mean, we, we had met a couple of times. I think we had messaged a couple of times about, you know, one thing or another. But but I certainly wouldn't we weren't friends at that point. But in one of the the ballsiest, craziest things I've ever done, I sent her a message on Facebook and said, Hey, would you be interested in co hosting a dirty game show? at dragon con with me because at that point i already had my foot in the door of the classics track and i had a pretty good feeling that they would go for it uh there there wasn't really any late night programming so i felt the opportunity and the space were there if if somebody stepped up and and grabbed them and I will never stop being absolutely shocked that she said that sounds like fun and from there I, mean, I, I still have these messages saved I, I if they, if it wouldn't take too much time I'd pull them up and read them to you now but uh, that was the start and we started going back and forth with ideas and I, I'm absolutely shocked that she took this big goofy guy that she barely knew had no idea if I was funny or smart or anything. Uh, I mean, they, they had read the website and they'd been on the podcast. That's what they'd been on the podcast at that point. Um, but I mean, really, you know, she really took a chance on me and, uh, I'll remember that for the rest of my life because it means a lot. And I've gotten one of the most cherished and valuable friendships, you know, more so than even the game show. Cause the game show far surpassed, I think either of our wildest dreams. Uh, well, not our wildest dreams, because our wildest dreams are we'd end up on like Netflix with an actual show. Uh, but I, I think it surpassed our modest expectations, maybe. Our, our most realistic dreams. How about that? Uh, far surpassed that. I don't think we, while we certainly hoped for a lot more than ever became of it, I don't think we ever expected to be in a what 900 person ballroom at Dragon Con that was that turned 200 people away at the door. I don't think we really genuinely expected that that would happen because the first year we did that game show was in the track room in front of like 150 people and then just 3 years later uh we were in you know this huge ballroom turning people away. Uh, just amazing and and I, I will forever be grateful to Dana for for taking a chance on me 
uh, and, and again, like I said, one of one of the most cherished friendships of my entire life. Uh, one of the most important people I've ever met. Uh, all right, let's see here. Let's move on. Oh, no, I've got another one from Bobby Nash. I'll swing back around to you, Bobby. Maybe. Can you fly, Bobby? Uh, all right. Uh, Wilson, our pal Wilson, who directed the aforementioned Troublemaker documentary about me. Um, who is the greatest horror director of all time, and why is it Glenn Danzig? Oof. Okay, well, I can't really comment on that because I haven't seen Verot is it Verotic or Verotica? I think it's Verotica. I haven't seen it yet, so I don't know. Maybe he is the greatest horror director of all time, but I can't explain why because I haven't seen his movie. I'll just have to take your word for it. But from my perspective, and, and honestly from the world's perspective, really, I mean, if you ask anybody on the street, uh, I think there will be universal agreement that the greatest horror director of all time is one Mr. Robert Zombie. I, I, with his his independent spirit, his dedication to true artistic vision above all else, no other creator in the history of cinema has created lasting masterpieces on the level of House of a Thousand Corpses, 31, and The Haunted World of El Super Bisto. It, they're, they're timeless treasures of the cinema. And unbelievably... The same inimitable auteur that gave us the classic rock and roll albums, The Sinister Urge, Venomous Rat Regeneration Vendor, and The Electric Warlock Acid Witch Satanic Orgy Celebration Dispenser is responsible for the greatest horror films of the last century. How is any of this even debatable? Fans and students of film will be analyzing the works of Robert Zombie for hundreds of millennia to come. He is the greatest artist of our time. So there you go, Wilson. There's the answer to your question. I hope you threw up. Uh, let's see. Robert McIntyre asks, What is your favorite run of comics? He spelled favorite with a U because he's English. What is your favorite run of comics? Can be ongoing or limited series. And I mean, this is a really tough one. And honestly... I could answer it next month with something different. I can answer it the month, a month after that with something different. Contenders, obviously G.I. Joe. Uh, Larry Hama's G.I. Joe, a real American hero comic, to me is, is some of the best graphic storytelling in the history of the medium. Uh, and the fact that he was, uh, I don't want to say constrained by a license, but I guess that's a fact, uh, and still manage to create these incredible stories, these ongoing stories, that if you listen to the Larry Hama episode of the Needless Things podcast recorded live at Dragon Con, he reveals that he was making it up as he went along. Uh, incredible. Uh, Uncanny X-Men, Chris Claremont's run, is unparalleled for its longevity, for changing comic book storytelling, for creating incredible, memorable characters and scenarios, Dark Phoenix Saga, um, just it, it's crazy. But I will say this about it: it's almost like old Doctor Who, and that you sort of have to already love it to revisit it. Because I don't know, like, if I handed an Uncanny X Men trade paperback to my son. I don't know that he'd get into it. And he likes the X-Men. He know, Matter of fact, we were playing X-Men Legends, the old PS2 game that looks like shit on an HDTV. We were playing it yesterday. He he knows the X-Men. He loves the X-Men. Um, I think Beast is... Well, Beast or Iceman. They're pretty close as far as his favorites go. But I don't know that he could get through one of Claremont's story arcs. I really don't. Uh, so I cannot... I, I take that into consideration when I'm thinking about my favorite run of comics. I love those, but I'm aware of the style of the era that makes them what they are. It's this, Like I said, it's like classic Doctor Who. I'm not going to tell any old person on the street, you'll like this, because I know they probably won't. Uh, Preacher, Ultimate Spider-Man. Ultimate Spider-Man, somewhat tainted by Bendis. Uh, I still think it's the best ongoing run of comics I've read in real time. But I just don't overall care for a lot of what Bendis writes. And he puts so much of himself into his writing 
that you can't separate. I, I I don't know how to explain it. I don't I don't want to sound like I dislike Bendis as a person, but you know Bendis when you're reading it. And while Ultimate Spider-Man very much stands on its own, it's almost sort of tarnished by other things Bendis have done has done where his style is overwhelming the content. If that makes sense. I don't know that it does. Uh, but my pick today is Grant Morrison's New X-Men. Uh, this one I've read several times. To me, it stands the test of time. It still feels fresh. Uh, it's still... well. And here's, here's Grant Morrison's magic trick and why I truly believe that Grant Morrison is a magician communing with some sort of alternate dimension and moving eldritch energies from this dimension through his brain and hands onto the printed page because somehow everything I've ever read by Grant Morrison where, where he's writing, you know, whether it's Batman or X-Men or whatever, he is staying true to the core of whatever it is he's writing but it still feels insane and revolutionary. Grant Morrison's X-Men stories are like no other X-Men stories you've ever read, but they are still 1,000% X-Men stories. And his that's his talent is for this kind of bizarre storytelling that manages to stay true. He's not subverting your expectations he's making you realize you could have even better expectations maybe uh i don't it's hard for me to talk about grant morrison because i've read stuff of his that i don't care for but the stuff of his that i do like i like so much that it's weird to me that somebody can be as gifted as he is uh Anyway, so his run on new or his new X Men was just it blew my mind. Uh, it's it's like I said, it's true to the X Men, but it's also insane and new. I think probably if somebody asked me what's the most horrifying comic book event you've ever read, experienced, whatever, the destruction of Genosha, it drained me. It hurt my soul. The way that he wrote it, uh, I it, it's it's it blew me away. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it, and it felt real. It didn't feel like comic book bullshit that you know is going to be undone in in six months, in a year, in two years. It it felt somehow he made it have impact. Uh, and also in New X Men, he gave us Zorn. He gave us Quentin Quire, one of the best mutant characters ever created. Um, he gave us the Cyclops and Emma Frost thing, which some people hate, and I think is great because it's real. It's complex relationships. It's it's nobody's perfect. Uh, nothing is perfect. It's it's ah, uh, so it's such a good story to me. He gave us Stepford Cuckoo, uh, Stepford Cuckoo's Phantom X, like. That's an incredible run of comics. And it's not just, you know, nowadays, if one significant thing comes out of somebody's run on a comic book, it's pretty impressive. And Morrison with New X-Men was just bam, 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 one thing after another, just crazy. I love it. I love it. If you haven't read it, you know, go uh, go to the Marvel app or wherever people get comic books now. It certainly isn't comic book shops. Uh, go on Amazon, and uh, although you might not want to order books from Amazon, because I, I recently, as as I ranted about, I think last week, uh, I, I will never order another record from Amazon, and I probably won't order any books because if they can't ter- take care of records, they probably don't take very good care of books either. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, Grant Morrison's New X Men, it's great. Uh, moving along, Gary Mitchell. The outstanding, incredible Gary Mitchell, one of the directors of the American Sci-Fi Classics track at Dragon Con. Uh, Had a good one. I liked this one a lot. Oh, the dogs are upstairs going bonkers. I hope you guys enjoy that. Uh, I've seen you use the Extreme Sets diorama backgrounds for displaying some of your figures. 
Do you prefer to put figures on the shelf with them, without them, and what factors into your decision on which ones get or don't get a background? So, uh, if you're not familiar with extreme sets, uh, you can go just Google extreme sets dioramas, and you'll see most of them are one sixth scale, although they do make one uh, eighteenth scale. But they're just, they're basically cardboard backgrounds, but they're really, really beautiful cardboard backgrounds that uh, attach together. And you can actually, like, some of them are actually buildings. Like, one of the upcoming releases is basically the cabin from Evil Dead. And it has, like, the porch and the interior and the, the hallways. And, like, it's. Some of it is really crazy detailed stuff, and some of it is just flat panels that connect together to create, uh, like, uh, for anytime you see a picture on the Needless Things podcast Instagram or the Phantom Troublemaker Instagram of new action figures, it's probably an Extreme Sets diorama in the background because it just makes it look so much better than I used to use this purple fabric in the background, which to me seemed very unique and personalized to me like if you went online and you saw this glittery purple background you're like oh that's one of phantom's pictures and and there was probably something to be said for that but over time that just got boring to me and i'm sure it got boring to the people looking at it as well so extreme sets had a big sale and i bought uh i think three different yeah three i'm looking at them right now three different sets i bought uh, an asylum a like haunted house and then like a space station and you can get floor panels to put down, but they just, if you're taking pictures of new figures to put up online, even if you're not doing like battle scenes or action shots or whatever, even if they're just standing there, uh, it just makes the picture look so much better. And I still feel that they're a little pricey. I still feel that they should be printed on both sides, especially if it's something like the Asylum that is actual rooms and stuff and not just sort of a backdrop. Uh, But if you wait for a sale, which I I think they do every once in a while, like have holiday sales or something, but uh, they're, they're worth it. If you like taking pictures of toys. Now, as far as displaying figures with them, I don't do that uh, for a couple of reasons. One I keep my shelves about 10 to 12 inches apart, depending on what's on them. And these are too big to fit in that space. And it would cost a fortune for me to have enough of these to cover all of my shelves. Uh, Maybe at some point in the future, I'll do like a, a video tour of the Phantom Zone. But right now, I'm looking at, what, 20... That's more than 20 feet. 20, 40, 60, 80, 80 feet of of seven foot walls covered with action figures. Uh, there's no way, and that's just this room. That's not even including the old office room where I've got like sort of overflow. I guess there's no way. There's no way I'm spending all that money on on backdrops when I can spend it on actual toys. So I'm happy with the three sets that I've got. It's possible I'll buy more in the future just to switch things up. But for the most part, with the the types of figures that I buy and take pictures of, I find that Space Station, Haunted House, and Asylum kind of cover all of the bases for backgrounds that I might need. Uh, I wouldn't mind having sort of an outdoor one but I don't think they've done anything like that, which is a little weird. Uh, But at the same time, having just like a a printed cardboard forest would probably also be a little weird, so I don't know. Uh, All right, uh, moving on, moving on, because we're we're almost out of time, believe it or not. I'm going to have plenty of questions left for next month, which is a good thing. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And by the way, uh, if you are at all interested in bettering yourself, DDP Yoga is amazing. Try the app. I think you can try it free for like seven days or something. It has changed my life. I started week 12 today, and I feel like a different human. Okay, moving on. Uh, from our pal Mike Gordon. Top five. Okay. 
So, our friend Robert spelled favorite with a U because he's English. Our friend Mike Gordon spelled favorite F-A-V-E for some reason. Come on, Mike. Top five favorite foreign films. Uh, I actually had to sit down and think about this one and, and write them down because if, I, if I'd if done it off the top of my head, I wouldn't even have been sure if something was a foreign film because that's kind of a tricky question because when I hear foreign films, I tend to only think of things like Italian horror movies, Japanese horror movies, uh, maybe Kurosawa. Um, I, I, I don't... There's some things that I don't necessarily think of as foreign that are foreign, and there's some things that are foreign that maybe shouldn't be thought of as foreign. I, I don't know. It's it's a the, I'm I'm making the question trickier than it really is. Uh, but here are my answers: uh, Danger Diabolic by Mario Bava, directed by Mario Bava. Um, it just came out. I think it came out this past Tuesday. Uh, Shout Factory released it on Blu-ray. It's basically all the same stuff that's on the DVD, but the picture is much, much better. And it's Blu-ray. And I'm going to buy any release of Danger Diabolic that comes out because I think it's one of the coolest movies I've ever seen in my life. If you haven't seen it, please watch it. Uh, it is an Italian movie, but it's in English. It's one of those weird things like where some of the actors seem to be speaking Italian but are dubbed in English. Some of the actors are speaking in English but are dubbed in English anyway. But it's incredible! It's so good. It's so cool. It makes Batman look like a bitch. It makes James Bond look like a pussy. It's just... It's the coolest, most stylish thing. I, I love it. I adore it. Uh, Lucio Fulci's Zombie. Just legendary. Legendary horror film. If you haven't seen it... I don't know how you haven't seen it, unless you just don't like horror movies. A zombie fights a shark. That's it. And look, a zombie fights a shark before sci-fi was making their bullshit movies. That That's how cool this is. Like This isn't like zombie versus shark, Saturday night at 10 on sci-fi. It's going to be some piece of shit with a bunch of digital sharks. It's Whatever, I don't need to go on. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's a cool movie. It's great. Uh, the Professional, or Leon the Professional, directed by Luc Besson. The incredible Luc Besson. Uh, director of Valerian, which is a, a wildly underrated movie. And if you don't appreciate it, you probably enjoy the taste of poop. Um, uh, Terry Gilliam's Brazil, which is the one I struggled with the most considering it a foreign movie. But it is a foreign movie. Uh, that is a fact. Uh, okay, and then finally, Tombs of the Blind Dead by Armando DeSorio. And it's not necessarily so much that that movie's great, although it is a lot of fun to watch. Uh, it's that I have a lot of fond memories of watching that movie with friends. Uh, hardcore zombie action, that's all I gotta say. Uh, Alright, let's see, where are we? Oh, I got time for a couple more, which is good. Oh gosh, alright. Uh, Arian, I'm sorry I'm going to have to save yours for next time because I think it deserves a little more discussion than what I have time for right now. Uh, okay, Jason. Jason Frazier, who has been on a couple episodes of the show. Actually, one of my favorite episodes of the show where we just randomly discussed Taylor Swift versus Hulk Hogan. Uh, go look for that episode. Uh, so you've been breaking out the old game systems lately. How is the gameplay on them compared to the mini systems, in your opinion? And if you don't know, he's talking about the NES and SNES minis uh, that came out over the last few years that have their little tiny versions of the original consoles, but they have the games built into them. But it's a limited number of games. And the gameplay is pretty much the same. Like, as long as you don't have a shitty controller, like a, a shitty old controller from the original system... There, there's no reason the gameplay is any different. But I would, in general, rather play the games on the minis because the interface with a modern TV is much better. Uh, it's easier to queue up. You don't have to blow on anything to get it to work. Uh, you don't have to wonder if it's going to work. It, it's just more convenient and easier. And plus, after five minutes when you get really, really pissed off that these old games are so hard, you can just switch to another game without switching out a cartridge or anything like that. So it's convenience-wise... Uh, 
and reliability wise, the minis definitely have the the winning factor there. But if you want to play something like uh, Flashback or Super Bomberman or Metro, well, no, Metroid's on the NES. Um, but any games that aren't on the minis, obviously you need to have the console or like an emulator or Raspberry Pi or whatever these fucking computer nerds talk about every time I talk about the fact that I'm, I've got a mini. They're like, hey, well, I've got 842 games on my Raspberry Pi that I stick up my butt and stick my thumbs up my nose and just play it in my head. Whatever the fuck they're talking about. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, the minis are great. The minis are great. And they're still. I think you can still get them for like a pretty reasonable price. So if, if you like classic gaming, uh, why not get one? Uh, why not? Uh, all right, and, and here I'm going to wrap it up with two questions from Schweck because they're both, well, they're both sort of related and they're both good questions that I really wanted to get to. Like, they're, they're, I love everybody that asks a question, but there are some questions that are like, oh, this will be fun to answer. And then there's some questions where I'm like, this is really specifically pertaining to me and my life experience, and I, I will enjoy elaborating and giving my opinion out. So let me get a little water here. Okay, so our head of research, Ryan Schweck, who you can catch on the Execute Order 60, or excuse me, Execute Chapter 66 podcast, uh, which is part of the Needless Things family. Uh, feelings on the current smaller weekly toy announcements with rotating properties that Hasbro Pulse is doing versus making bigger, more in-depth announcements at events. Uh, I don't know. They're both good, right? Like, it's really cool to know that every week there's going to be some kind of cool little announcement. And, and, you know, I don't know that every week is fair to say because I'm sure right now they're sort of trickling out San Diego Comic-Con stuff maybe. Uh, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know exactly how they're, they're deciding. You know, maybe some of this is stuff that wouldn't even really have been necessarily reveals, uh, because Hasbro, especially with like star Wars, they've been really coy about announcing things for the past several years, really since Disney got the, the property. Um, I like it. I like fandom Friday or whatever it is. Even last week, it was some power Rangers thing that I didn't really care about. But then I saw the figures of the the six inch putties, and I was like, "Ah, oh, that's really cool." I I don't want them, but if you're a Power Rangers guy, you're gonna want like a dozen of those things. I think that's great, and it looks like it's two pack, so it's troop builders. So like, and and here here's an advantage of that weekly announcement is if they had dropped that at San Diego Comic Con, I probably wouldn't even have looked at it. I probably wouldn't have paid any attention to it whatsoever because I don't care about Power Rangers. Um, but now they're dropping stuff like that. They're alternating properties, you know, every other Friday. Like I think this Friday, uh, you know what? I don't remember what it was, but it's something different. Uh, I, it's neat. It's really cool. I enjoy it. And, and I do think to a certain degree over the past few years, we've already been seeing that the internet to a certain extent is making these big convention announcements a little obsolete. Uh, you know, so far I think Mattel has been utilizing the, the lack of convention environment incredibly well with, with their WWE announcements, you know, toy fair, they had some cool stuff, but it wasn't overwhelmingly great. But then, normally WrestleMania Access would have been their big, big reveals, and WrestleMania didn't happen in a traditional way this year. There was no access. And they went online and made a big event out of these cool reveals. And I think that's neat, and I think it's more inclusive in a way, because, you know, this is going to sound weird, but no matter how you slice it, if all of these big announcements are being made in a place where you can't be, it there's a little... I'm a little sour about it. Uh, and I don't know, maybe that's weird. But, like, I get excited about stuff, but at the same time, it's like, well, somebody 
have a fucking convention here in Atlanta. I mean, look, Dragon Con, greatest convention of all time, 100%. But it's a fan-run convention. Big companies like you know Hasbro, Mattel, whoever, uh, do not come to Dragon Con to show us toys. So it's a different animal. So there are no trade show type things here in Atlanta where we can go and have that experience. And I'm not going to San Diego to be mauled by massive crowds to see some toy reveals. And I guess that that then the answer to that is, well, then Phantom, you don't get to see the toy reveals in person. But I, I don't know. It's It just feels like there's an elitism to the Toy Fair reveals, to the San Diego Comic-Con reveals, to the New York Comic-Con reveals. Uh, and whereas these online reveals, they make, I think they make fans feel like we're more a part of what's going on. Um, and you know, the word exclusive can be good, but it can also be bad because the root of exclusive is exclude. And I don't think it's good for the toy industry to exclude too much right now. And that makes a great segue into uh, Ryan's second question, which is, con exclusives, NACA mainly, are currently showing up at Walmart for prices lower than they were sold at New York Comic Con. Should companies at least make changes before they release to maintain the specialness of the release to the package, etc., or does it matter? Um... So, one, I don't know exactly what he's talking about here. I don't know what New York Comic Con exclusives are showing up at Walmart. Uh, but I do... I think there's a time and a place for exclusives. I think exclusives should be repaints. I think exclusives should never, ever be must-have items. I think doing Macho Man Randy Savage in a Slim Jim box in his Slim Jim's commercial outfit is a perfect exclusive. I think doing a Macho Man Randy Savage figure that's the only way you can get Macho Man is this exclusive is a terrible way to do exclusives. Uh, a really good, another good example, uh, Playmates for a couple of years did these really cool repaints of the old Ninja Turtles line. I think those are great exclusives because you don't need them. They're not must-haves, but they're really cool and they're different and they're unique. I think that's great. Um, Han, Han Solo with the Minoc in the big Millennium Falcon uh, box. I think that was a great exclusive because we don't all need to have a Minoc. We certainly don't all need to have that giant Millennium Falcon box that's hard to open without fucking it up. Um, I think that's a good exclusive because later on Han came out by himself. Great. Fine. That's perfect. Uh, Snake Eyes, the recently released Snake Eyes from G.I. Joe Classified that came with the big weapons rack and is painted differently from the retail version. Um, I think that's a good exclusive. I don't know if that was going to be a Comic-Con exclusive. I don't know what the original plan was for that, but that I'm fine with because you can still get a Snake Eyes figure. Uh, I don't like it. Uh, so that Spirit of Splinter that NACA did as part of their Loot Crate when, when they relaunched Loot Crate. That's a great exclusive because it's a cool repaint, but it's not a necessary figure. There's another Splinter out there available. Uh, now, granted, that one is GameStop. Well, it was San Diego Comic-Con exclusive, and then it was GameStop exclusive. But that's another thing is like shared exclusives are a different level of, of exclusivity because you have wider access to them, and that makes a big difference. And and also, licensing comes into play with something like that. NACA is very restricted by Nickelodeon's ownership of the Ninja Turtles license. That's why they have to release these things the way that they do. That's why our great retail partners, Walmart, who, by the way, have sent me two crushed Star Wars retro figures, by the way, such great retail partners, um... That's why everybody has to bow down to them because they're the biggest toy retailer in the world even though their toy section is shit every time you go in their store. They have so much power 
over these toy companies who are just trying to get cool products into consumers' hands. And sometimes the only way they can do it is to make a deal with the devil. And that's literally what Walmart is. And believe you me, Walmart loves the coronavirus. They love it. Walmart and Amazon both think it's the best thing that's happened in years. Um, it's got anything that kills small business, these fuckers are delighted over. Uh, boy, that got off track a little bit. Uh, so, uh, Bebop and Rocksteady uh, dressed up as the Easter Bunny. That's that's another one of NACA's Loot Crate exclusives. That's great. Nobody needs those figures, but they're really cool, different, unique things you can add to your collection if you're willing to do whatever you have to do to get the exclusives. I think those are neat. Here's here's one I'd like to throw out there, and this is based on uh, our pal Chad J. Shonk, um, the, the greatest Star Wars fan in the world. He has been watching G.I. Joe lately. I can't imagine what might have influenced him to dip back into the world of G.I. Joe. Uh, he mentioned to me uh, the episode, I think it's from the Pyramid of Darkness episodes, where Snake Eyes ends up dressed basically as Boy George. What a great exclusive that would be, right? Who I would jump all over that. Everybody would want that, but it's not something that you'd get furious about if you just couldn't get one, because you still have a Snake Eyes figure. So, uh, as far as the toy companies, though, yes, I absolutely think that there should be differences between exclusive items and retail items, but I don't think the difference should be you can only get this critical character from this exclusive set or whatever. I uh, like the the fact uh, turning right around here uh Rad Ranger, the the incredibly busy and and much missed Rad Ranger uh got me a three pack of Star Wars Black Series figures that's a Disney Park exclusive that comes with a ray that I do not need, a Chewbacca that I do not need and that is actually oddly orange and ugly. But I did need the Hondo Onaka figure that is in this box set because it's the only way he's been released. And I think that's an even bigger load of horse shit because you have to buy two figures you don't even need. Now, it also comes with a couple of Porgs, and I can always use more Porgs, so that's fine. But this is the only way to get Hondo. And he is not part of the Rebels re-releases that are coming out this fall. So, yeah, that, that kind of stuff I think is horse shit. Uh, but... For the most part, yeah, I like if they're going to do... Uh, I actually, and, and I begrudgingly say this, but I like the way NACA has been doing their Walmart exclusives because it's the same figure, but it has some really cool exclusive artis, uh, artistic packaging. Uh, if you haven't seen their Evil Dead Ash, it comes in this really amazing eye-catching red and white box, and I've already got like three versions of that same Ash, but I almost bought it again just because that box was so cool. But I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this box, so I didn't buy it. And now I'm, I'm a little bit kicking myself because I didn't, but whatever. I, that's 25 less dollars Walmart managed to get out of me, so that's a victory. You guys, I think that wraps it up for this needless Q&A. Uh, thank you for hanging in there. Thank you for listening. If you submitted a question, thank you for that. If you submitted a question and I did not get to it, tune in next month because I do keep these. I do rotate them, and eventually I will get to all the questions. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't have any wrap up really. Uh, I, everybody, I hope is getting through. I hope everybody's making some money now. As things are opening back up, I urge everyone to still be cautious, still be careful. Um, you know, if you're going out, wear a mask. I, I actually I posted this the other day. I said, think about how much of a dipshit you would have felt like a year ago wearing a mask out in public. Now, feel like that much of a dipshit if you don't. And I firmly 100% believe that. Wear a mask. Why? Because why not? Why not be as careful as you can be? Uh, but, and this, look, this is my doctor. I am not a doctor. I am not your doctor. Your doctor may have a different opinion. My doctor said, don't wear gloves because gloves give you a false sense of security and plastic and nitrile and whatever else will actually carry viruses longer than human flesh will. So if you're keeping your hands away from your face and you're washing your hands as much as you should be, which, by the way, is no more than you should have always been washing your hands, you filthy animals, 
then you should be fine. Don't wear the gloves. Gloves are not a good idea. But this is my doctor. You should consult your own physician and find out their take on the glove situation. But I stopped wearing them because I'm a big hand washer anyway. So I've I've been kind of good to go on this from, from day one-ish. Uh, you guys, thank you for listening to the show. Please go subscribe to the Needless Things YouTube channel. Go join the Needless Things podcast Facebook group. Uh, follow Phantom Troublemaker and Needless Things podcast on Instagram. I try to keep the accounts different uh, as much as I can. I try to put up different content for them. Uh, and, you know, who knows what's what's happening in the future. Uh, I, I, for me personally, I, I can confidently say conventions are off for the rest of the year. Uh, I've already concert-wise, the one of the, the Ministry Cam FDM Frontline Assembly show has already been rescheduled to April 20th of next year. I am hopeful that corn and faith no more will be similarly rescheduled uh hopefully not to april 20th though and uh just you know take care of each other take care of yourselves i hope you're getting through this uh if you need to talk to somebody about nerd shit send me a message i'm i'm not apparently i seem sort of inaccessible and to a certain extent I am because if I'm hanging out with my family I'm not going to answer your message but I will answer all messages at, at some point it may not be right away probably won't be right away but I answer every single message I get uh, whether it's through Facebook whether it's through the Needless Things Podcast Facebook group whether it's through Phantom Troublemaker at gmail.com uh, I answer everything unless it's hey Phantom we saw your Instagram account and wondered if you'd be interested in more global exposure in, in which case I will just delete that bullshit alright you guys uh, that's all I got for this week tune in next week for more Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle stuff I love you guys thank you for listening to the Needless Things podcast you're the best you can find the show on iTunes, Stitcher, Downcast, or in the ears of a Trader Vix employee. Love you. Mean it. Uh-huh.